Hi, this is Phil Newman from Longevity Technology, and I'm joined today by Dr. Evelyn Bishop. And uh, Eva, great to see you. Great to see you too. Thank you so much for coming all the way to see me. Ah, well, it's a pleasure. We've been meeting each other at various conferences, but never had a time to really sit down and talk about what I think is one of the most important subjects in the longevity space at the moment, which is clinicians. This is a very important part of the industry, which is emerging at the moment, um, but it's still got some way to go, and you're a big part of that now. So I'd love to talk to you about that today. Um, but what can clinicians do now to help people with their longevity? You're doing it every day. What, 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 do, you, what do you do with your patients? Right, so thank you so much for, you know, I'm very much in agreement that clinical part in longevity medicine is really what counts um, to bring the field further. So of course we build up on gerosciences, AI, computational science. Um, a lot of things are coming into our you know, technology and daily life from all the other disciplines. I think also longevity medicine is really the most multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary field of medicine for me. Something that we are at least trying to shape also as a specific discipline, perhaps first under the roof of internal medicine, later on maybe a separate one. And um, as my mentor is saying, the, the field can only move as fast as clinicians do. And what the clinician can do right now, what for example I'm doing with my longevity patients, which hopefully very soon will be much more scalable with help of IT and AI, is to first and above individually choose the panels of diagnostics, longevity diagnostics, that of course includes some of the preventative parts, but then also the advanced measurements that we have already in longevity medicine, which might still not be fully validated, which might still be more in a sense of longitudinal data collection in order to find the biomarkers that we need and to validate them so that later on we can intervene and check the interventions that work or not. And so this is why we are definitely measuring the biological age with different clocks. We are basically using liquid biopsies for various checks. Of course, genetics plays a big role, polygenic risk scores, um, brain age, cognition, neurodegeneration, measurements that are available back on this, but both from blood or head MRIs. Um, microbiome is a very big part of it, microbiome both in the gut and in the mouth and um, a lot of other physiological testings that we would do on a much more granular basis than, than the regular checks. So it's not the three times a day blood pressure measurement or the one time at the doctor's or the one time body composition uh, testing uh, at the gym, but really daily or blood pressure ongoingly. And it's all possible right now with the help of devices. We are all doing that. Um, for the patients. Of course, there is an individual approach. It's not like a bulk and everybody's doing that. When I have a patient who is 30 and is already at a very good health and we just want to optimize, of course, the measurements might be more advanced than for a patient that is 85, mm -hmm. where I do not want to have, you know, the, the lady like a Christmas tree full of, of devices while sleeping, but, you know, the quality of life being put as one of the top priorities, um, Measurement quantitatively and bringing it together is something that a longe longevity physician can do already. Mm -hmm. And then to very smartly collect it so that later on we can use it better and, and, and really apply it for more people. Yeah, so, so obviously the field has still got a way to go. Well, th there are requirements in the future for us to have standards across the industry, but it's still an early industry at this stage. Uh, but you're working with patients. So what are you seeing that patients should and shouldn't be doing at the moment? Um, for example, uh, do you get involved in prescribing rapamycin, for example, and, and that type of thing? Interested to know what you're doing with your daily patients. Right, right. So it's a very good question. So um, I'm very much coming from the academic setting, very evidence-based setting. Obviously, working with oncology patients, I'm very much used to guidelines and recommendations. And I'm open-minded. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm very open-minded <laughs> being in the field, the, the more so. But... Um, I'm always appealing to patients that they should not experiment or just should not copy paste regimens that somebody else is you know, doing or taking for themselves. I've had examples where people just you know, searched online what could be taken, somehow got the prescription or not, or you know, in many places you can get it just like that. Um, 
And even with supplements, overdose, obviously, and not knowing that they had some underlying problems or didn't know how the body will react, they came with kidney failures, they came with biological ages massively increased after all this type of thing. So, um, so I would definitely appeal to patients to, to seek the advice of a doctor. And um, myself, I do not prescribe gel protectors now in, in, um, you know, in a normal setting. Um, but there are some patients that are rapamycin for other indications. Mm -hmm. Uh, metformin, yes, quite uh, quite often, but again, it's a question for whom and at what time and when, how much do they exercise, what's the basic, you know, sarcopenic level, uh, are they at least pre-diabetics or at big risk? There is a lot of, you know, um, let's say stratification that is going through my mind when I see the entire patient, yeah. Yeah, so, so when you're looking at the patients that you see now, you've got your, your own regimes that you're working with. Now you have the program that you've been running, which obviously is to help scale this up and to train people around the world. Uh, do you feel really at this stage that the academic engagement with clinical longevity is there now, or is this something that you felt you had to do the course to be able to get, get things started? Um, so interesting to know what your view is. If you time slice today, what is the perception of uh, longevity within the clinical community? Thank you very much for this question. Actually, it's a very interesting one, and I never really analyzed it chronologically. I think um, it was just Corona time, and we saw that everybody is online, and there is a big need and big interest in, in people learning online. And of course, we knew that there is a big gap in you know clinicians being educated. There was actually no course at that time that we knew of that was really um, customized for physicians, speaking in the language of physicians. Mm -hmm. There were, of course, plenty of educational resources for scientists or scientific language, but really, you know, clinicians are talking, you know, are a bit different. And so we had this idea to do it. And the, the idea of the course, and it's for free and it's available for everybody, became a tool in something that is my personal dream, and of course, Alex Javoronkov and, and man, many others, to bring a curricula like this mm -hmm. into the academic um, setting in the med schools. And so we actually, you know, reached out, and NHS UK was actually the first platform, the first system that adopted it for all the physicians, um, already for the physicians. Yeah. Um, and then we had um, other uh, academic institutions and med schools that expressed their uh, interest. So Tel Aviv will be implementing it next year. Uh, ETH Zurich probably also very soon. We have German, Italian and uh, Spanish universities, med schools that are um, interested. And I realized that the interest grew also among academia, um, medical schools, perhaps also because of, you know, always some sort of personal relationships. So I've been, for example, in the board of the European Federation of Internal Medicine for a while, and at the National like European Congress of Internal Medicine this year in Malaga, we had the plenary session, like the main session in this huge Congress of all global internal medicine um, on longevity medicine. Wow. And I was speaking, and I, I was invited to, you know, I was allowed to invite somebody, and I invited Dr. Felipe Sierra, who, you know, for me reflected the <laughs> longevity medicine personality per se, being from an age and so on. So um, I think we see a revolution. I would love to see more. Mm -hmm. I would love it to be easier. Um, and I see that also in every country, it's a very individual. At every university, it's a bit different. Just to give you an example, in, in, in Tel Aviv, for example, we were asked to, um, at, you know, to, to make a piece of longevity something into the courses that were given there. So longevity cardiology, longevity endocrinology, and so on. So subdiscipline based. And at the ETH Zurich, for example, they have a med school um, panel module called age and aging, or healthy aging, where they would put longevity medicine as a part of the course. So, you know, um, so for this you have to adjust, but it's, um, I think people are more open and the greatest development, I think, 
two greatest developments was well, number one, gerontology. So coming from oncology and working in longevity, I always wanted to somehow bring it together. It's so related. And in the University of Basel, um, Professor Werther and myself in Shanghai, we established gerontological centers where every single you know, oncological patient that is coming is tested for biological age, for all the markers, for NLP, for um, you know, for skin and all this. That's very interesting. So, so you're actually bringing that into into daily practice now. It's there. Right. Yeah. Interesting. And what tests are you using for biological age out of interest? I mean, is that something that you're standardizing at the moment between the two centers? Yes, we are standardizing it. We have a protocol. So we are using the blood age, the skin age. We are um, looking at doing epigenetic testing out of saliva. Right. We are obviously also biobanking all those samples. Uh, including tissues of the, you know, wh whatever we can get from the surgeries. Uh, NLP, so we are recording the voices, right? Uh, it's a little bit of a language thing there, but it's uh, the GAIT, the G8, so the geriatric assessment, fully physiological assessment, so stand up test, and the grip test, and so on. Um, um, for some of the patients who have an MRI, we also do brain age, who are getting anyway a brain MRI um, or a head MRI, and there will hopefully be also very soon a microbiome biological age that we will implement mm. as well and of course we would like to add more like cardiological and so on but um, obviously we have to start somewhere and it's already quite large and you know yeah that's fascinating so so really in terms of embedding biological age as a as a as an indicator of overall health you're seeing that happening already which is which is very encouraging now um the work that you're doing at sheep university in israel is really interesting isn't it because uh, as I understand it, you've now got a, um, a, a new announcement that's just, that has been made, but I hadn't heard of it. So I'd be love to learn a little bit more about that. With pleasure. So we've made an announcement and it's now very official and hopefully we'll also be able to show it more uh, next year in the first conference. But Sheba uh, Hospital, uh, affiliated with Tel Aviv University, so it's obviously a state public academic university, research facility and clinic. Um, is opening a longevity, I call it longevity department, obviously it's like a longevity center, but it's basically um, a place where people will come to get diagnosed with all the measurements of longevity that the center will offer and that will, I cannot disclose probably everything that is in the, in the protocol, in the panel, but it's quite abundant and it's obviously included in, so it's, it's not commercial, so people don't have to pay for it. And um, there will be also collaboration with biobanks, collaborations with the research, but there will be physicians, usually very, very high level physicians mm -hmm. from internal medicine, endocrinology, gynecology, and so on, um, who will be working with the patients and also suggest interventions. So it's interesting. So, so what, what is the, 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 the rationale? Why, why did it exist in the first place? Is it because literally to help people reduce their biological age as an indicator of their future health? Exactly. To really bring healthy longevity to Israel and not only to Israel, through Israel of course spread it. This as a model hopefully also to other countries. We've been talking a lot about scalability of healthy longevity and I think this is one of the greatest examples, right? I mean, Singapore also has an example and we've been facing the opening of the Healthy Longevity Center there. So great work by Professor Mai and, and Kennedy. Um, and the Shiba Longevity Center is really in, in this like geographical special room the longevity department per se. Mm. So, yeah. Fascinating. So will that be part of the national infrastructure, do you think, going forward, using this as a, as a base case to then run it out over different centers? Hopefully. So definitely we are, you know, inviting and we will hopefully establish the dialogue with the with the government and, and with the national policy makers, with the stakeholders. Uh, but even if this will not work, I mean, it's already there. So it's a good example. And we have already established that we will be collaborating closely with other longevity centers. So, um, of course, with Singapore, we are all very good friends, but also me being in China, of course, also with the Healthy Longevity Center in China, right. which is uh, also on the way to being built in a public hospital. So that's also happening right there. Um, it might just take a bit more time because it's a much larger scale. 
and also in Hong Kong and um, yeah and collaborations also with with some university centers all over the world obviously. well that's really really encouraging to hear so uh, well Eva uh, always a pleasure to see you and likewise. thanks for your time today and uh, keep up the great work thank you so much for having me and likewise Dito keep up the great work thank you